All right, so we're in Romans chapter 1, and I've entitled our, our time tonight, God's Good News, and it's part 3. So we spent three weeks talking about verses 1 through 7. In fact, we've worked our way all the way up through verse number 4, and tonight uh, we're going to look at verses 5, verse 6, and verse 7. And that will complete the introduction here in Romans. So what I want to do is to go back to verse number 1, read the verses we've already covered, and then we'll narrow in on verses 5, 6, and 7. So let's read together. Romans chapter 1, verse number 1. It says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So, so everything that I just read, we've already went over uh, for the past couple of weeks. But here's where we start treading new territory. Verse number 5. It says, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name, among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to those in Rome, excuse me, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be His saints, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 1-7 through seven are Paul's summary of the good news of the Gospel. And he just... He dives right into it at the very beginning of this letter to the church at Rome. I want to tell you a story right quick before we dig into verse number 5. Years and years ago, there was a very wealthy man. And because he was very wealthy, he was able to acquire a lot of different paintings, a lot of different pieces of art. I mean, when I talk about acquiring art, I'm talking about very expensive pieces of art and very expensive, very famous paintings. Now this guy was very well known, very wealthy, <laughs> uh, a really cool collector. And he had a son who was just kind of ordinary. And he really wasn't famous at all. He wasn't very wealthy. No one really even knew who he was. But his dad loved him so very much. So much. Well, uh, this young man, the son, eventually died unexpectedly. Like just, he was a young man. And through different circumstances, he ended up passing away. And it broke his dad's heart. I mean, like, you've heard of people dying from a broken heart. That was the case for this man. His heart was broken. And he ended up, the father died three months later after his son's unexpected death. Now, after he had died, people knew that this guy was very wealthy, and they all wanted their claws, all, they all wanted their hands on his art collection. Well, it was stated in this man's will that the, all the art had to be publicly auctioned. It didn't go to anybody specifically, it was just to be auctioned off to the public. And part of the, his will stated that the first piece of art to be auctioned was a painting of his son. Now, maybe you guys have heard this story before, but it rolls into the day of the auction, and people come from all around the world to try to get their hands on this piece of art. Well, to get their hands on this collection of art. And so the auctioneer brought out the painting of the son and put out to display, and everybody just started laughing. You see, because this painting was painted by someone that really wasn't famous, it wasn't recognized, and really, nobody even knew who this son was, so nobody really wanted the painting. Everybody's kind of laughing. Hey, let's get on to the good stuff. So as the bidding started on this painting of the son, nobody, nobody bid. And so it was this kind of awkward silence for a long time. Until eventually, an older man who was a servant of the father and a friend of the son dug around in his pocket and pulled out all he had. Now, this was many years ago. He pulled out 75 cents, and it's all the servant had. 
So he placed a bid on the piece of art of the son for 75 cents. No other bids at all. <laughs> Nobody cared. They're like, okay, let's move on with the show. Auctioneer called out, is there anybody else? No one would bid, so it sold to this servant of the family. The gentleman hobbled up, took his painting, and then the, auction looked at the, the auctioneer looked at the crowd and he said, all right, the sale has closed. And then he proceeded to read the rest of the will, which stated this. It stated that whoever cared enough for his son to buy the painting would receive the rest of the estate. That's pretty wild, isn't it? For 75 cents, this man received the whole entire estate. You may ask, Brother Travis, why do you share this story after reading Romans chapter 1? The story that I just shared with you is an illustration of God's love toward sinners. Anyone who loves and receives the Son, Jesus Christ, will inherit the Heavenly Father's estate. So whoever loves the Son receives the inheritance. Listen to this. This is Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3. It tells us that everyone who receives the Son by faith is blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. This is one of the reasons why Paul in these first seven verses of Romans was so tore up and so excited about the good news of Jesus Christ. Listen to what he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 9. He says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, that you through His poverty might become rich. Our riches that we receive in Christ as the inheritance 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 9 says, These riches are things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered into the heart of man. All that God has prepared for those who love Him. All of these riches, these glorious riches, God has preserved and created for those who love the Son. Kind of like the story. The riches that we have in Christ, the good news that we even have a chance to know Christ. It's a long list, and it goes beyond our imagination. If you have your uh, paper, I would like to fill in a few blanks before we go on. The Christian has, your first blank, life that will never end. Again, that first blank is life. We have a spring of spiritual water that will never dry up. We have a gift that will never be lost. A love which, can, which He can never, in which we can never be separated. A calling that can never be revoked. A foundation that will never be destroyed. And an inheritance that will never diminish. So many riches whenever we begin to talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. And tonight, we're going to finish Paul's summary of that good news. So number one, notice the provision of the good news. Look at verse number five. He says this. Well, you go back to the last part of verse four. It says, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace. Now let me fill in your next blank and then I'll explain verse number five. The good news of God provides conversion. When we learn about the gospel, when we learn about the good news, it is that good news that provides us with conversion. Conversion takes place by God's grace. And vocation, that's your second blank. Vocation, which in Paul's case was apostleship. The good news provides us with a way to be saved and it explains our purpose in life. Now, Let's look at verse 5. It says, Through whom we have received grace. Through the gospel we have received grace. What's the question? What is grace? Do we know what grace is? We have little children running around the church whose name is grace. Biblically, what does grace mean? You want to write this down. 
It's unmerited and unearned favor. That means your salvation, the love that you've received from God, you did nothing to earn that love. Grace is giving something you really don't deserve. Grace is something that you can't contribute to. It's, how can I say this? You can't contribute anything of worth in order for God to love you more than what He does. Listen to this. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, Paul explains. He says, For by grace you have been saved, through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. It's not a result of works that no one should boast. It is God's grace that gives us mercy. It's His grace that grants us salvation. Well, to any who will trust in His Son. It is God's grace that He opens His mouth and sovereignly breathes into us spiritual life. As a dead man, it is by God's grace that the life from Him is breathed into us in order that a dead man can have spiritual life. Unmerited favor. Unearned favor. You see, we have become spiritually alive. Why? Because of God's grace. It is by His grace that we are created anew with the very life of God Himself. Now let me explain this just a little bit more. Because when we talk about God's grace, this is what really tore Paul up. I mean, this is why he was really excited. When we talk about salvation, it should humble us. You know, many people, when they talk about their salvation, they build themselves up. Well, I did this. I found God. But that's not the way true biblical salvation works. In salvation, we have no room for self-congratulations. Man contributes nothing, nada, zilch, to his salvation. You see... Human achievement has no place in the divine workings of God's saving grace. It's unmerited favor. He gives it to us freely, not because we have done anything at all. Listen to this. Romans chapter 3, verse number 24 says, We are justified as a gift of His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. You see, a redemption or a salvation that involves man's work or man's boasting are completely useless. So if, if it's in your salvation story, it's about a man's work or your work, or if it gives room for you to boast, it's completely useless. We have to understand salvation and redemption are based upon what God has done, not man. Salvation does not come by, and I know many of you know this, but for those that are listening online or maybe even someone here tonight, you have to understand that salvation does not come by baptism. It doesn't come by church membership. It doesn't come by going through the little classes of confirmation. It doesn't come through communion or church attendance. It doesn't come by keeping the Ten Commandments. That's not how you're saved. It doesn't come by trying to serve other people or just serving enough, serving God enough. That's not how you're saved. Did you know salvation doesn't even come by living a good life, by being respectable or being a moral person? That doesn't save you. It doesn't even come by simply believing there is a God or believing that Jesus is God's Son. Did you know even the demons in hell believe in God, and they also believe that Jesus is God's Son, yet they're not saved. There's many church members that walk around and they say, yeah, I believe in God. I think Jesus is God's Son. But that doesn't constitute true salvation. In fact, I've wrote this on your paper so that we're clear. Where does salvation come from? What is true biblical salvation? Salvation comes only when a person repenting of sin receives by faith the gracious provision of forgiveness offered by God through the atoning work of His Son, Jesus Christ. Salvation comes by grace, unmerited favor, 
by grace through faith. We trust solely in what God has done through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's how we're saved. Positionally, you have to understand, just coming to church doesn't change where you are positionally before God. Being a good dad, being a good son, all that, contributing money to the church, that doesn't change your position before God. The only thing that changes your position before God is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's how we're saved. Now notice, that's good news, right? As Paul describes the good news, that, that alleviates the burden from our life. I don't have to be good enough in order to get to heaven because Christ was enough. He goes on in verse number 5. He says this, Jesus Christ our Lord through whom we have received grace and then he says, and apostleship. Now, not only do we have good news that we have salvation, God also calls those who are saved, who have received grace, into service. He uses the word apostleship here. Paul uses this word in verse number 1 to describe his calling. But you have to understand from last week, uh, the Greek word apostolos simply means one who is sent. Now, last week we talked about who are the apostles. We talked about the 13 men who God sovereignly chose to preach and to teach and to accomplish miracles to authenticate the message. We talked about that last week. We're not going to go over it again. But in a more general sense, we have to understand that those who have trusted in Christ are in a general sense apostles as well. Now, how? I want to be clear here. Because we're not going to go around calling everybody apostle. The linguistics of this word, this, it tells us that there is an office of apostle, and then there's this general term apostle. Let me describe it more. We, in a general sense, are sent by God into the world as His representative. We might even use the word an ambassador. That's a lot easier. So in an unofficial sense, we are sent by the Savior to represent Him to the lost and dying world. Now, there are other men in Scripture besides the 13 who are described as apostles. Uh, I'm not even going to... Acts chapter 16, verse number 7, you have, some people call him Junius or Hunius. Um, you have Barnabas in Acts 14, 14. Epaphroditus in Philippians 2, verse 25. They were sent, but they did not have the office of being an apostle. So, again, they were simply sent of Christ. Let me just clarify for just a second. Why, why am I covering this? Well, here in verse number 5, it says, let me back up a second. Yeah, verse 5, through whom we have received grace. So grace comes first, and it says, and apostleship. If you've received grace, if God has forgiven you of your sins, He's changed you, given you a new nature, that means you are a part of the team. Now, this isn't like a middle school basketball team where you're on the team, you get the jersey, but you really don't get to play. You ever been there? You ever seen that? Kids get so excited, hey, I'm on the team, but they're really just warming the bench. That's not the way it works. That's not the way it works with the Lord. You see, whenever you're on the, the team, you get playing time. When God calls you and you're officially on the team by grace, He puts you into service. And that's what Paul's saying here. Everyone who is saved by God's grace will be called to apostleship. If you're on the team, and I hope you are, that means it's time to exercise. Oh, that's a bad word, right? To exercise your spiritual gift. When you're saved, you're given at least one spiritual gift. The reason why you're given a spiritual gift is not for you, it's for the church. When God saves you, he wants your gift to be plugged into the power source, which is the Holy Spirit. But it's like all the different appliances we have in our kitchen. We have a blender. We have a toaster. We have a coffee grinder. All those things are plugged into the same power source, but they all have different functions. 
That's how the local church is supposed to work. Each of us are given different gifts to be plugged into power source to serve. Your gift's meant to build up the rest of the church. My gift is meant to build everyone up. All right. I didn't fill in your blank. Let me, let me do that. Whatever our limitations may be, God calls us by His grace, but He also calls us to His service. There is no excuse if God has called you by His grace not to be serving in some capacity within the local church. There are no spectators in this sport. All right, number two, the proclamation and the purpose of the good news. Look at verse 5. It goes on to say, to bring about the obedience of faith. So God has called by His grace to salvation, but He's also called them to serve, but also to bring about the obedience of the faith. What does this mean? It means when you are called, there must be a pattern of obedience in your life as a litmus test to the validity of your faith. So you can't walk around and say, hey, I'm a Christian, and then the pattern of your life is continual, habitual sin. There has to be a genuine remorse in your life. Any person who claims to be a Christian, yet the pattern of disobedience to God's Word, the Bible says, it, especially in 1 John, like we really need to ask hard questions. Is that person really in the faith? Now, faith that doesn't reveal itself in obedient living is fake. You can't say, well, I'm of Christ, and then not be obedient to His Word. I'll tell you what. Don't take my word for it. Let's actually turn over to 1 John. So, if you're in Romans, turn to the right. See if we can find it right quick. First John chapter 2. If you want to know if you're a real, genuine, saved believer, spend some time in First John. It's like a kick in the teeth. First John chapter 2, verse 3. I'm going to begin reading says this, and by this we know that we've come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps His Word, in Him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. I'll read verse 6. Whoever says He abides in Him ought to walk in the same way in which He walked. So again, we're not saved by good works, but we're saved to good works. When God... You see, the natural man, before he's converted, he really isn't ashamed of anything. He's just going to do what he wants because life's about him. But the moment God turns a light switch on in his life, he knows what I'm doing is wrong. And he's embarrassed by it. And he desires to change because of it's kind of like the illustration we shared about the pigs. You remember this one without me saying it? You see, before we were just wallowing in the filth of our sin. We didn't care. But if at, at that moment you could snap your fang, fingers and change a pig into a man, he'd be embarrassed he was wallowing in the pig slop. That's how it should be in the life of a born-again believer. All right. Uh, What's it mean to call men to the obedience of the faith? So we're called to be obedient to the faith. We're supposed to dig into God's Word. Basically, we, we shouldn't just be a Christian in name. It means living in submission to His Lordship. There's a lot I want to say. To the man or the woman who continues to build their life on a continual disobedience to God's Word, who says, oh, I'm a Christian. I, I, don't, I don't have to obey Him. That person's building their life on the sand. And eventually, the storms will come and that foundation will be wiped out and they'll be 
washed away without God and without hope. Next point on your paper, the purpose. Look at verse number 5 again. This is, this is really good stuff. Look at verse, it says right here, for the sake of His name among all the nations. Let me back up. It says, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of the faith for the sake of His name. Why does God grant grace? Why does God put us unto service? Why should we obey Him? For the sake of His name. That's the reason why. We're reminded here that the primary purpose of the Gospel, the primary purpose of the good news, is not man's sake, but God's. I'm telling you, this is what spiritually will nourish your soul. Why do we have the good news? Why do we have the Gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you know why? It's not for our sake. It is for God's sake. Let's fill in your blank. Man's salvation is simply a byproduct of God's grace. Its, man, its main focus is to display God's glory. Let's fill in the next blank. The preacher, the promise, the person, That's what we've talked about for the past two weeks. Now, the provision, the proclamation, the privileges of the good news, everything about the good news of God are given for the express purpose of glorifying God. Why does God save man? Not for man's sake, but for His sake. Go back and look through all of the Old Testament. Don't take my word for it. Why does God save people in the Old Testament? Why does He do that? Is it for their sake? That's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose why God saves people in the Old Testament is to glorify His name. It wasn't man's sake. It was for God's sake. Salvation for fallen and helpless man is of importance to God for man's sake, but it's indefinitely more important to Him for His own sake. God saves because it brings glory to His name. This is why I get so tore up whenever I hear people share their testimony and say, well, I've done this and I've done that. No, you didn't do diddly squat. You're robbing God of His glory in salvation and redemption. Man, you didn't do nothing. Have you been to the funeral home lately? Do you understand what a dead man can do? Nothing. And that was used spiritually until God turned the lights on by, through His Word, through the revealed Word, through the power of the Holy Spirit. So stop taking credit for your salvation, saying, you did this, I found God. No, you did not. You're a dead man. God, this is your fill in the blank, God is ultimately and totally committed to the exaltation of His glory, not yours. You know, when you talk about God and His purpose in salvation, this is a stumbling block to many people. Our fallen nature, our fallen perspective, it trips us up. We don't like to talk about, well, God only saved me for His glory. No, we like to say, well, well I won't even get into it because I can get in the flesh really quick. Understand this, when we don't give God the glory in salvation, like, that is a great sin. And it's a great discouragement. You see, God is perfectly worthy for any glory that He receives in our salvation. Listen to this, Philippians chapter 2, verse number 10 says, At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Why? Why will every knee bow? To the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow. Why? Yeah, He loves us. And man's salvation is a byproduct of His grace. But He does that in order to exalt His name, not ours. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 15 says, 
that the grace which is spreading more and more and to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound in... Boy, he's talking about there. There's more and more people saved. Why? To abound to the glory of God. You know, that's why and how we pray for people's salvation. Lord, please save this person uh, because it will really help our family out. And I just hate to see the suffering they're going under. That's no way to pray for someone's salvation. But whenever you begin to pray and say, Lord, glorify your name through saving this person in order that you would receive the glory for it. And then stand back and watch God work. He will. According to His perfect will. It's very important that a person believes in Christ and that that person is saved. But it's more important that God is glorified. And that salvation is granted. How? Through His will and through His power. Alright, let's see here. I want to move on to uh, number three. Let's notice next the privileges of good news. Look at verse 7. It says, To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The first privilege of receiving God's grace, the, the first privilege of being a Christian is being loved by God. That's good news that God loves us. Every believer is loved by God. Why? For the sake of His Son. God loves us because of His Son. Listen to this. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Say, God is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us even when we were dead in our transgressions. Even when you were dead, even though you had no spiritual stimuli, God loved you. He saw you in your sin. He saw you in your filth. You know what He did? He didn't just let you continue life however you wanted. He, by His Spirit, gave you that divine stimuli to where you, hey, this is legitimate. This is real. Out of everything else in the world, this is authentic. And you responded by faith. Alright, so that's to be loved by God. He loved you enough to save you. Number two, the second privilege is a calling. Verse number seven says, to all those in Rome who are loved by God, and the second part, and are called. Now, when Paul says those who are called, in verse number seven, he's not referring to this sort of general call. There is in Scripture a general call for people to come to Christ or to be saved. Some of those examples are Isaiah 45, verse number 22, which says, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. That's a general call. It's, it's generally given and broadcast to every person. Isaiah 55, verse 6, Seek the Lord while He may be found, call on Him while He is near. That's a general call. Come, repent. He sends it out to everyone. Revelation 22, verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. That's a general call. Those general calls, that is not what Paul's describing in verse number 7. He's talking about a specific call. A specific way. Those who have responded to that invitation have been sovereignly and effectually called by God. Now you'll say, what's the difference in these two callings? When we get to Romans chapter 8, I'm going to dig in so much deeper into what is this calling, what's it mean to be called by God, but I'll just give you a preview. In chapter 8, verse 30, the Bible says, And those whom He predestined, He called. And those whom He called, He justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. You see, it's, it's really hard from a human standpoint to realize that we first came to God a lot of people think that we first come to God by an act of our own will. But that's biblically not what we learn. So from God's Word, we have to understand we were dead men. I think we all get that. We couldn't have come by Him on our own unless He called us. He breathed life into us. 
as an act of His gracious, sovereign will. So this calling here is different than a general call. This is a very specific call. We're going to talk about that more later, but let me fill in your blank. The reference to being called to salvation are always, in the epistles of the New Testament, efficacious calls that save, never general invitations. So this, man, as I dig in, when we talk about calling, when we begin to talk about election and all these different things, and as you begin to read the course of the New Testament on your own, you're going to see this popping up everywhere. That God does issue a general call. I mean, even Adolf Hitler had that general call. He had the chance to turn and be saved. But then we have this sort of specific call that Paul's referring to, in which God calls you by name. He's chosen. He set you apart. And again, I want you to go and do your own research, as I've done. There's some passages on your paper, and I want you just to look at Scripture through that lens. All right, let's keep moving. Third, the third privilege is the opportunity to be called a saint. Here, this Greek word, hagios, means to be set apart. Let's look at it. Verse 7, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. The basic meaning of saint means to, again, to set apart. Have you spent any time in the Old Testament, you would see that there's all kinds of things that are set apart. People, things, you have the tabernacle, you have the temple, you have the furnishings, the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Holies, all those things were set apart for him. You have the Levites, you have an entirely fresh people that are set apart. Just for the service. The tribe of Levi, the nation of Israel was set apart. You have the tithes, the offerings of the people that were set apart with other gifts specifically for God. That's all the Old Testament. God set things apart. What about in the New Covenant? Did God set apart anything in the New Covenant? You see, under the New Covenant, He didn't set apart a temple or a tabernacle, or an ark. All those things, they don't exist anymore. What are the holy things that God set apart here on earth? That's exactly right, His people. When God graciously and sovereignly acts and breathes life into a man, He sets him apart. He's called to be different than the world. So the new temple of God, the new priesthood, is His church. All right, I want to just give you a few more things, the last part of verse number 7, and then I'll be done. Let's read verse 7 again. It says, To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says here, To all those who are loved by God in Rome. I think this is very interesting. And the reason why is he never says to the church at Rome. Do you know why? Well, it the reason why I believe he doesn't address the church in Rome is because history shows us that the believers in Rome didn't necessarily meet in a church. They met in houses, scattered. They had house churches. So he doesn't just say, okay, the one that's at 777 uh, Roman Drive. No, it's, they're scattered out. They're meeting in people's homes. I think that's super cool. I also like how he does use the word saints. He'll use it over the course of this letter 38 times. He refers to believers as saints. Is it wrong for us to refer to other believers as saints? No. And here's the reason why. Every time Paul uses the word saints, he doesn't use it to refer to behavior. He uses it to refer to status or position. So if we had access to your thoughts or my thoughts over the past week, you probably wouldn't want to describe me as a saint. But positionally, we can refer to our brothers and sisters in Christ as saints because that's who we are positionally. Not on the basis of our behavior, but what Christ has done. Super cool. 
we'll start addressing you as saints. Uh, Saint John. Or, oh, we better not do that. That sounds kind of... You, you get my point. It's not about behavior. It's about position. So just to kind of end the plane, lay in the plane, we see here, it says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's sort of Paul's last plug in this introduction for people to understand all this good news he's described in verses 1 through 7 all center around Jesus Christ. That's how the good news is, is made possible. It's not just about what he has done, it's also about who he is. That's, that is the good news of the gospel. Now, next week, I want you to read ahead. Just read to verse number 15, verses 8 through 15. And we're going to talk about, really, what does is, what is a man of God look like? We're going to talk about Paul. We'll talk about some other things as well. But read ahead, if you will.